Imagine a world where music can be used for more than just soothing the soul. In the medical world, myoclonic seizures are one of the most prevalent conditions, despite there being many surgical and pharmacological treatments. Before we dive deeper into this topic, let's introduce the team. I'm Jasleen. I'm Lucinda. I'm Maria. I'm Sherry. I'm Erica. I'm Han. And I'm Krish. I'm Tarun. So epilepsy, according to the NIH, is one of the most common neurological disorders, and it is caused by excessive electrical activity in the brain. Specifically for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, it's, it may, mo mostly affects the basal ganglia, and it, in, it has several characteristics like generalized tonic-clonic seizures, which are characterized by the shaking, no, yeah, shaking and jerking movements throughout the body during the seizures. It also has myoclonic jerks, which are sudden jerks. Um, and for JME, it's mostly in the arms and legs. And patients also con usually experience absence seizures, which constitute uh, just sudden lapses in consciousness. Um, and during the seizures, sometimes patients do experience consciousness, so they're conscious while they're seizing. And the seizures uh, usually follow states of relaxation. So they usually follow uh, waking up in the morning after a night's rest or your evening period of relaxation. And uh, a lack of sleep and sudden awakenings at night can largely increase the likelihood of seizures. Um, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is usually first developed during puberty, and it can be detected by an EEG. However, it's easily diagnostic, it's easily to be diagnosed by a physician. So the EEG is usually just used as a supporting tool. Sound therapy is the use of sound music or rhythm to achieve a goal of reduce of stress or improvement of quality of life. Right. And the main way that we plan to administer sound therapy to psychiatric patients is to the use of pink noise, which is an, sound, which is an assortment of sounds usually ranging anywhere from 400 to 4,000 hertz, so usually on the lower end of the auditory sound spectrum. And it, when patients are listening to pink noise, it helps us better read and also understand brain activity. And by using pink noise, along with the use of neurofeedback um, and an electroencephalogram, which is an EEG, we can track brain activity and monitor it over the course of a long time to notice when the pre state of a, of a patient is approaching, which is uh, the first stage of a seizure. And as soon as that occurs, the EEG will give us a warning basically in the form of like some sort of indicator, like a sound or alarm, which will signal them to play, mu play the music, which is the music or the pink noise uh, that's inside the music and basically that can help prevent the seizures and in the long term as this practice continues it can hopefully put an end to their seizures permanently. The proposals to use neurofeedback along with sound to treat the excessive electrical signals that cause epilepsy. This trains the brain to stop the electrical signals when the sound or music is played. Effectively preventing the seizure in the long run. Our research question is, what are the implications of using a minimally invasive treatment to decrease the frequency of seizures in, in juvenile myocolonic epilepsy, as opposed to more generally accepted forms of treatments like medication or surgery? There are social and legal issues we need to consider. The first social issue, um, one of the biggest ones, is whether people would want to try a new treatment or if they'd be more interested in sticking with what's been studied and what's been proven effective already, like medication. But is medication always effective? For people with refractory epilepsy or drug-resistant epilepsy, or for people hindered too heavily by um, side effects from medication, it's possible that music therapy or sound therapy would provide would be a better treatment option for them. If it is successful, it may even minimize or completely eliminate the need for some patients to even need more invasive treatments. 
and this provides them with a more accessible, lesser invasive, and cheaper treatment option. On the legal side, they are concerned about the music being used in music therapy infringing on copyright laws. According to the music, the American Music Therapy Association, if the music therapist records a protected work as part of an intervention, the working assumption is that it is accept, accept, acceptable as long as the recording isn't copied, shared, or distributed publicly. Unfortunately, medical ther uh, music therapists can't control if a patient decides to copy and share the music. And for this reason, it may be an issue when trying to implement this treatment option. And now we're gonna talk about some ethical issues. The first ethical question that needs to be addressed is that if music therapy is even a viable solution. There have been many studies that have shown music therapy, especially pink noise, has been effective in reducing the amount of seizures. In one instance, patients were had to listen to Mozart's K448 in order to, over the course of 15 days for two hours a day, to reduce the amount of seizures they had. This was effective in reducing 50 to 80% of the seizures. Although many of us do not want to listen to two hours of Mozart for, per day, this is where the neurofeedback device comes in. We use the neurofeedback device to detect EEG signatures of the preictal stage of the seizure. And when this is detected, music will start playing, specifically pink noise or some of Mozart's pieces for that brief time, lowering, calming down the brain, thus preventing the seizure. There are also many risks that come along with using music therapy. Some therapeutic, in some therapeutic instances, people may not have the proper training. Some types of music can also increase seizures, which can prove to be harmful. And there can also be technical malfunctions with the neurofeedback device. These technical malfunctions may cause some companies to not want to dis mass distribute or supply the neurofeedback device to, for therapeutic use. There's also a conflict of consent between child and parent. This is because if the child consents to music therapy, they also need parental approval. However, the AMTA does not address when per, uh, there's a conflict between these two parties. Right. And now, even though those concerns are certainly valid, that's not necessarily, that's not, that's not to say that the reliability of medication is always ensured. For example, in 2017, there was a report on the shortage of a drug named clobasm, which is widely used to treat seizures. And even now to this day in 2023, those statistics are still not far off from what they used to be. And in addition, even if certain drugs even like clobasm were available, sometimes they might not always be effective in treating seizures. For example, about 30% of patients were proven to be uh, drug resistant for seizures. And it's important to consider all patients regardless of even like a small percentage of minorities. An issue that we came across were that certain sounds can actually trigger seizures rather than stopping them because they're not in the sound frequency of pink noise, which ranges from 400 to 4,000 hertz, which is why it's important that an experienced psychiatrist explains to the patient as well as the patient's parents on how the neurofeedback and sound therapy works. Another issue are participants with uncontrolled seizures, which was shown in, in a study where Mozart's piece K448 actually increased the participant's seizures instead of decreasing them just because they had uncontrolled seizures. And because of this, it's critical that this therapy only be used on patients with controlled seizures rather than uncontrolled. And although there are a lot of issues because this is still an ongoing research topic, this is what this is a very promising treatment because it neurologically conditions the brain to use the sound and associates the sound with seizures so they, they so that they can stop before they ever have start. So although there are, uh, so although sound therapy or music therapy is technically a non-invasive treatment, it isn't just something that you can say or do and then immediately just do it. There are some recommendations of, there are some things that should be recommended doing before um, thinking of just doing it or making it. One of those is like keeping controlled trials, making sure that um, the patient 
is well off, that they aren't in any danger whenever any of the music is playing, that seizures aren't about to be uncontrollable and are going to damage the patient. There is also keeping time and regularly and manage because um, probably the patient's brain is always, every patient's brain is always different. There is the um, matter of maybe certain regular times affect each brain when listening to pink noise. So maybe with one patient, it's better for them to listen to, to listen to it longer than with another person. So it's better to make sure that each patient is well off with the with that. There's also the testing different level, different levels of pink noise because there is a huge there is a huge like gap between pink noise frequency. Each patient might have a different frequency level that their brain is better affected with. So it's best to try different, try these different levels to see which one affects them better and make sure their seizures either calm or, or just eradicate completely so that they don't have to suffer from them. And also for accessible devices, it isn't just, is it affordable, but also um, something that they can be comfortable wearing in the outside world, such as headphones, because you don't want them to buy this device or acquire this device and make and they're uncomfortable using it outside because it because of judgment or stigma between what they're using or what they're wearing. Um, so it is obviously recommended to have something that they're comfortable and easy to monitor as well. We do acknowledge that keeping regulated and managed trials increases the cost and the amount of time that people have to put in. This is why we suggest having preclinical trials in order to prove the prove the effectiveness of this therapy, and then it can be used freely. Of course, we'd like to give a thanks to LI and all the judges, the panel here for attending, as well as every doctor that helped us get to where we are, and a special thanks to Nadine for help for our team lead. This is a really interesting presentation. Um, I liked I liked the way you handled it very very much, the idea that you you went from sort of the idea of music therapy to a component of the music being sound and then a component of sound being pink sound, and what that then might mean and then how would that need to be administered? Could you couple that? In other words, a relatively low tech approach with a medium tech approach like neurofeedback, and then could you use that as some form of music induced autogenicity training? for individuals, for example, who are, who are pediatric patients who may have certain contraindications or there may be some balance of benefit, burden, and risk with regard to taking medications, particularly longitudinally during their development. So I really like what you did. I like the way you handed off the information to each other. The slides are very, very clear. I like the use of the references. And you really did a nice job, I think, in proposing certain things and sort of throwing it out there. What if? What if? which allows the listener to kind of put their own conclusions together, which you didn't necessarily force feed anybody. So that was very, very well done. And I commend you. How do we go over to Dr. Rawson? Very nice presentation. Um, I echo a lot of what Dr. Giordano said. Um, just want to highlight a few things. I think it was interesting um, that you brought up some of the, like, the legal implications of this. Uh, just the sort of thinking, it got me thinking about how do you regulate such a unique intervention such as this, right? There's a device component to what you proposed, but the, the concept of, of music or, you know, sound as being, uh, you know, this, this is the intervention, this is quite unique. And, you know, there's definitely implications there that you raised. Um, I also very much was interested in something you brought up at the end, which was, um, you know, basically the idea of personalizing, the, the importance of personalizing the um, intervention to each person, right? And that kind of, uh, you know, addresses numerous things. One, uh, you point out that that this intervention could have risks for people too, right? Like sometimes it could increase the risk of, of seizures and to some extent decrease it, but to kind of hone in on that range, right? You want to home in on what is the actual frequency. You, know, you It's a big range, but you want to home in on that. And that's kind of parallels some of the work that's done in, in the deep brain simulation world, trying to find the right frequency, right, for a person. It made me think of that. And we're talking about sound here. This is very cool. 
Yeah, I really like the um, the combination of the the low, medium, and high tech that you have on this. Um, the idea of using sound waves to entrain brain rhythms in order to to function as an anti epileptic. Um, there is some limited evidence for it, and and you you did a great job of presenting it. Um, your slides, everything about your presentation went really well. I echo the things that my colleagues have said. Um, before about this, um, you did a really just elegant job, and I'm gonna, I'm just going to keep this short. Great job. Uh, agreed, agreed. You know, when we sort of watched you develop this, you seemed to have a lot of pieces that connected two things, and then two other pieces that connected two other things, and we were kind of really interested in how you would quote unquote not only find all the dots but then connect them, and it came out really nice. There was a, a chain. Of, of argument and process and staging, admitting the knowns, admitting the unknowns. So this is a very nice model of uh, kind of creative research. Mm -hmm.